we just have to carry on because apparently there is a problem international with some countries listening to the audio and some country not able to listen to the audio. So uh, I think we just carry on and uh, I apologize, but we will make the slides available uh, for everyone. So now um, I said I was going to talk about dynamic measurement of uh, uh, fluid management and what's new in fluid management. And uh, um, first of all, my disclosure, I have done uh, research and collaborated with a series of hemodynamic uh, monitoring uh, companies. Uh, however, I didn't receive any compensation for this webinar. Um, a lot of the information that I am um, describing here today, you can find available on this document, which is the uh, consensus of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine on Circular Artery uh, Shock. And the, uh, a lot of this information, as I said, was published about three years ago, but uh, very little change in terms of the recommendations that we are making. Um, another document that you can use to look into this is um, something that we produced in the cardiovascular dynamic section of the European Society of Intensive Care. And this uh, is something that we produce to basically give some basic uh, information and some take-home messages on how to uh, find uh, in the uh, right way of selecting which less invasive devices could be used for um, the management of patients in shock. Um, often I'm asked what is the uh, most important thing when we looked at our patient. Is it hypotension or is it hypoperfusion? The truth is, as we see very well from uh, this uh, paper from the group of uh, Shapiro, that actually it is the combination of the two that is probably the most important thing. Indeed, I can find the patients that have a low level of lactate. However, if they are vasoplegic, uh, they will still be associated with a significantly high mortality. And on the other hand, I could have patients with very good blood pressure, but if they have a high lactate level, this patient again will be associated with a high mortality. But as you see, it is the combination of the two, vasoplegia and hypoperfusion, that is really characterized by the highest level of mortality. These are those patients in septic shock, these are those patients that are the most challenging for us to uh, treat. And uh, of course, it goes without saying that it is from here that we are starting everything in the context of hemodynamic. The audio now is working, thank you. What we are uh, really doing is clinically yes, identified yes, patients that are in shock, which means that uh, through our clinical windows on the patient, the mental state of the patient, the respiratory rate, uh, the temperature of the skin, the modeling of the skin, the capillary field time, uh, through all of these things, really, we are uh, trying to understand if this patient has a problem of hypoperfusion. And then from that, we are uh, trying to see whether we can use uh, ways which the manipulation of cardiac output are uh, not uh, are something that we can use really to improve uh, the care for our patients. So, why is it important then to look at the amount of fluids they were given? Because one could argue we can just open the drip and just give lots of fluids to all of our patients. Well, it is becoming more and more apparent and very consistent in the literature that patients that receive very large amount of fluids are patients that usually are not going to do very well. And uh, we had this from papers from 10 years ago. More recently, this is a paper that has just been published in intensive care medicine from the group of Marek. And uh, what the authors found really was that there was a significant exponential increase in the mortality rate for this patient when patients were receiving more than five liters of fluids in the first 24 hours. Of course, these are studies that are more looking at an association rather than a causality um, because it's probably likely that the patients that require so large volumes of fluids are patients that usually are very sick. Nevertheless, 
it's very important to derive that this signal is pretty consistent in every observational series that we see in patients in shock. When we give very large volumes of fluids, we tend to see that there is an association with worse outcome. And in some papers, we also see the opposite. When patients are treated in a too restrictive way, at the same time, we see there is a sort of a U-shaped relationship between the amount of fluid given and the benefit for our patients. So what do people do when they uh, decide to give fluids at the bedside? With Fenice, which is a, a paper that we published with the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, we found that in 2015, still static variables of preload were preferred compared to dynamic variables of preload uh, when uh, clinicians were deciding how to guide fluid management at the bedside. And in practice, still in 2015, the CVP was the variable that was used the most. Now, this is surprising, and the CVP is a very important physiological variable. However, thinking that we can use the CVP or absolute values of CVP in a static way to guide fluid management is just physiologically wrong. And the Gaiton has told us that if we think about our cardiovascular system as a system which is made by elastic bands that are our vessels, part of the blood volume will be characterizing what we call down stress volume and part of the volume that will be in what is called the stress volume. It is only the stress volume that contributes to generate the pressure that we can call the mean systemic filling pressure. And why is this pressure is important in the context of the CVP? Well, if I have the degree of filling of the circulation and I have my mean systemic filling pressure, then if I want to have a gradient for the venous return, it means that my heart normally will have to work to try to maintain the rate atrial pressure lower than the mean systemic filling pressure. This is a very important context from a physiological point of view. It means that a very good heart normally will try to keep this pressure here, which is equivalent to the CVP, as low as possible. Indeed, an healthy person normally would run on values of CVP that are close to zero. And if I need to have a gradient between two pressure, of course, I need to make sure that this pressure here is lower than this pressure here. So it would be counterproductive to try to have a high CVP if I'm not increasing the mean systemic filling pressure. And indeed, the rationale of giving fluids is not to increase the pressure here. The rationale of giving fluids is to increase the stress volume to try, hopefully, to increase the gradient for the venous return. So it's not a surprise that when we look just at absolute values or CVP, actually the CVP does not work to predict which patient will respond with an increase in cardiac output when we give fluids. And indeed, from this paper, a very famous paper from the group of Jean-Louis Thibault, we found that there are patients with a very high CVP that will still respond to fluids and patients with low values of CVP that will not respond to fluids. And we tested these in uh, experimental settings in which we were uh, looking at the gradient of the venous return. And indeed, what we found was that patients that are able to increase their cardiac output are those patients in which the gradient between the mean systemic filling pressure and the CVP rises in response to fluids. Well, actually, those patients in which there is no increase in cardiac output, it means that if the PMS, if the mean systemic filling pressure increases, then the CVP increases by the same amount. And that means that the gradient is not increasing. So the first message is static ways of looking at the CVP are not of any use. And uh, uh, if I want to understand how the CVP work during a dynamic situation, the best way is probably always to look at stroke volume or cardiac output and see what happened to the CVP more as a safety limit rather than our target. So for instance, I could have a, a very low a uh, very poor contractility, the corresponding stroke volume and preload and CVP and preload curve, and I could have a good contractility and the corresponding CVP preload curve. Now, I can imagine I am taking these patients from the emergency departments where they were treated with the first amount of fluid, but I still want to understand if this patient, maybe they have some potential to increase their stroke volume and cardiac output. Now, if I give a fluid challenge in these two very differently uh, physiological situations, then I can see what happens, for instance, if I am already working on the plateau part of the Friend-Starling curve, 
Then if I'm measuring stroke volume and cardiac output, I will see that the increasing stroke volume and cardiac output here is minimal. The increasing CVP clearly is not correlated to an increase in stroke volume. The big increase in the CVP is telling me that the heart is not able to cope with the increase in mean systemic filling pressure and therefore is not able to pump the volume forward. So a big rise in CVP during a fluid challenge that does not increase cardiac output is actually telling me I'm starting to pay the price for this amount of fluid that I'm giving and probably I should stop. On the other hand, if I'm giving a, a fluid challenge and I see an increase in stroke volume and cardiac output, and maybe no increase in the CVP at all, then maybe that's telling me that the fluids are tolerated quite well in that patient. So very importantly, I cannot look at these absolute values to predict which patient will respond to fluids. And very, very importantly, the delta changes in the CVP are working completely in the opposite direction. So of course, they cannot be used to titrate my response in terms of cardiac output. What do we actually use at the bedside to guide our judgment? Um, it seems that blood pressure is often a trigger to give fluids and increases in blood pressure, so changes in blood pressure are often a way to assess the response to fluids. So in practice, if we see that the blood pressure increases, we think, okay, the cardiac output has increased, this patient has benefited from uh, fluids, maybe we'll give some extra fluids. Other values that we look are decreases in heart rate, Interestingly, urine output is quite often used, even if the time lag uh, and the relationship between increases in urine output and uh, changes in cardiac output is very poor. And funny enough, even changes in the CVP are still used to look at this while I've just shown you that physiologically, that does not make any sense. Now, when the blood pressure increases in response to the bolus of fluids, uh, of course, that's a good sign. It means that the cardiac output has increased. The problem of blood pressure is that it becomes blind when there is no change in blood pressure, and really we cannot say that there has not been a change in cardiac output. Because what happens is that the body tends to autoregulate now to a different level of blood pressure. And indeed, uh, for instance, what we found in this study, in which we looked at the marker of arteroventricular coupling, like the dynamic arterial elastance, we found that there is a group of patients in which the dynamic arterial elastance will change, uh, but actually, the blood pressure will not change even in patients that had an increase in cardiac output. In practice, it means there are some patients in which the cardiac output increase after fluid administration is completely blind if I'm using just blood pressure to look into it. And those are those patients in which if I'm not directly looking at cardiac output, I would not be able to understand that that patient would have an increase in cardiac output and potentially benefiting maybe from extra fluids. So what can we do in those cases when patients do not improve quickly to our treatment? Well, we think that it's very important to have a better look at the cardiovascular function. And in this sense, echocardiography probably is something that we all need to become more familiar with. And indeed, in our consensus, we advocated that uh, we should use echocardiography as our preferential way to assess the cause of shock and maybe to think about some therapeutic intervention. But then on top of that, there are a lot of other monitors that we can use to continuously monitor and treat our patients. And the amount of monitors that is available uh, on the market now, it's uh, really wide. Now, I'm often asked, what is the best monitor? What is the monitor that I should get for this patient? The truth is that there is not a single answer for all of this. Now, when I think about using a cardiac output monitor, in my mind, I always think about the ideal situation, and the ideal situation is a device that is very accurate and very precise. It means that the value that the device gives me is very close to the real value of cardiac output of my patient, and it's also very precise. It means that if I am a recording over a period of time, that device will be able to track very little changes in cardiac output. Now, what I really don't want is a device that is not accurate and not precise. But the truth is, when I'm giving fluids, I can probably tolerate a certain degree of inaccuracy. That means even if the absolute value of cardiac output given by the device is not as close to the real value of my patient, as long as the device can track with precision changes in cardiac output, when I give fluids, probably that's OK. And I will show you why. When I give fluids, I have decided before 
that my patient may improve uh, the perfusion by giving uh, a bolus of fluid and therefore by seeing whether there is an increasing stroke volume and cardiac output. So I actually don't really know what is the best value of stroke volume for my patient. And I really don't care too much if I'm starting from 30, 40, or 60 milliliters. What I really care is that I am able to track a change in the right direction. And this percentage change from baseline is really the most informative thing, more than the absolute values where I started from or where I'm heading to. And in a similar context, when I looked at the prediction of fluid responsiveness, and for instance, a way to do this is by using hard lung interaction. In these cases, if I overimpose the airway pressure of a ventilator to an arterial pressure waveform, we know that the cyclical changes in the intrathoracic pressure, they generate changes in the venous return mainly. And these changes in the venous return are reflected also in changes in the output from my ventricle. If I record this with some devices that are able to look at stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation, for instance, this cyclical variation I can use to predict uh, the response to fluids even before giving a bolus of fluid. The interesting thing about this concept is that actually, as you see here, I'm taking away all the absolute values and what comes out is as a percentage. So for a percentage, I'm not so interested in the accuracy of the absolute value of the number. I'm more interested in the precision of the number and the fact that it's able to track changes over a period of time. And Jean-Louis Teboul, uh, my chair today, uh, published a seminal paper on pulse pressure variation, which uh, is being really a, a paper that is being opened in the way uh, for uh, uh, many years now on this field of the prediction of uh, fluid responsiveness by looking at hard lung interaction in ventilated patients. And as you see, the area under the curve for the uh, pulse pressure variation is extremely good, which means that if I am under the right physiological circumstances, which mean patients that are completely ventilated, uh, sedated, adapted to the ventilator with no arrhythmias and with tidal volumes of about 8 milliliters per kilogram, this is a market that is very useful to predict which patient will respond or not to fluids, even before I give fluids. Uh, this context is a physiological context, doesn't really depend on the monitor that I'm using. Uh, as long as I'm able to find the window to look at these physiological uh, variables, this can work whether I'm looking at an arterial pressure waveform, whether I'm looking at cardiac output and stroke volume variation with a cardiac output monitor, invasive or non-invasive, and whether I'm looking, for instance, at the vena cava with a, an echo machine. Uh, the interesting bit uh, that uh, was uh, recently published again uh, by the group of Jean-Louis uh, was the fact that even in situations where normally you cannot apply this, and for instance in intensive care we now tend to ventilate our patients with a very low tidal volume, uh, they found that a small tidal volume challenge, so increasing the tidal volume just by a small amount for a few minutes, was then able to give us a test with a significant accuracy and precision to uh, find out which patient will then increase their cardiac output in response to fluids. Uh, however, this does not always work. There are situations in which there are some pitfalls. Um, we say that the cyclical variations that we see in cardiac output due to the ventilation are often related to the preload. Uh, however, there may be situations, for instance, in the case of severe right ventricular failure, in which the cyclical changes on the ventilation are affecting more the right ventricle rather than the preload. And therefore, a high stroke volume variation or a high pulse pressure variation in this context may not be predictive of fluid responsiveness in patients with right ventricular failure because what I'm actually seeing is in effect on the right ventricular afterload. Similarly, uh, there are other situations like, for instance, a very high intradominal uh, pressure in which, again, the uh, efficiency of this test in terms of sensitivity and specificity is affected. Uh, and in this study that we published together with the group of George Osinger and Jules Wendon, in London, for instance, we found the pulse pressure variation in patients with liver failure that often had large volumes of ascites and uh, rise uh, intradominal pressure, as you see, was better than the CVP to predict fluid responsiveness, but not really uh, having a good area under the core for a reliable use at the bedside. Other ways that we can use to predict the response to fluids are again um, using the hard lung interaction, this time in a different way. And we can, for instance, do an end expiratory pause, which means that we uh, 
let the pressure uh, from the intrathoracic pressure um, going down, this is like uh, uh, dropping my CVP and therefore this slightly increasing the gradient for the venous return from a Guytonian perspective. And if I see a small increase in cardiac output when I do this maneuver, then it's very likely that if I give fluid then to this patient, this patient will increase uh, their cardiac output. Another way to do uh, this uh, prediction completely independently from a ventilator, and again, uh, is the group of jean louis that is being a pioneer in this field, is by uh, doing a passive leg raising test, uh, which is basically a test in which we give an autologous reversible fluid challenge to our patients by tilting the bed from the semi-incumbent position to the legs up. And what happens is I'm basically immobilizing part of the uh, blood volume from the lower compartment for a very short period of time. If I'm measuring with a continuous cardiac output device what happens here, then a patient that will increase the stroke volume and the cardiac output in response to this maneuver is likely to increase the cardiac output if I then decide to give fluids. So in practice, when I have to decide which monitor I want to use to uh, look at fluid responsiveness, whether I want to monitor fluid responsiveness when I give fluids or whether I want to predict the response of fluids even before giving fluids. The most important thing is a change in stroke volume. The percentage change is more important than the absolute value, and I need to have something that gives me a continuous fast data acquisition. So our statement in the consensus that we published in 2014 was basically that we think that considering that fact that we should not uh, overfill our patient, we should always assess the volume status and volume responsiveness in all of our patients. Um, we should always use uh, the variables in a dynamic way. Static variables have demonstrated now for many years not to be accurate when we want to predict the response to fluids. And when we decide to give fluids, let's do it in a controlled way. Let's perform a fluid challenge. And how do we perform fluid challenges at the bedside? Um, Again, Fenice was showing us a very uh, wide picture in terms of practice at the bedside. And when you see data like this with this amount of variability in the volume given to patients in the rate used in the duration, uh, when you have to question whether this is just reflected in the individual patient variability or maybe on the fact that we uh, don't really know very well how to perform a test, even if it is something that is part of our daily practice. And uh, in this sense, we started with our group uh, to look at the fluid challenge as if it was a challenge with any other drug. And we started to do some pharmacodynamic studies in this sense. So we use a, an approach in which we are looking at the area under the curve for the effect of fluids on cardiac output. And uh, we also looked at what happened over time after the fluid challenge was finished. Now, Obviously, patients that were responders to fluids had a higher area under the curve. This goes without saying. It's a self-selected group of patients. Uh, but look at this. Uh, the maximum change after the administration of fluid is something that we see just one minute after the end of fluid administration. This means that when we give fluids, we need to do it in a short period of time, but also we need to be there at the bedside to look at the response. And this is very important because if I wait maybe 10, 15 minutes, I come back and I've not assessed what happened to my patient, I may miss completely this response. Indeed, both in responders and non-responders, it seems like the sustainability of the response was not very good. And even responders to uh, the fluids were actually going back almost to baseline after 10 minutes. So I really need to be there. I need to do the test and I need to see what happened to my patient, preferentially with a cardiac output monitor device, at least for those patients that are failing to improve with standard therapy. Um, the other thing that we were interested to see was if I decide to give fluids and I want to give the minimum amount of fluids to give the best response so that I can trust whether the response is a real positive or is a real negative. And what we did was randomizing patient to receive either one milliliter per kilogram, 
2 milliliter per kilogram, 3 milliliter per kilogram, or 4 milliliter per kilogram of fluids in of about fluids five minutes. About and as you see, what minutes. we found was that and if we give one to two milliliters per kilogram, not all patients reliably increase the mean systemic filling pressure, which means that not every patient will receive enough fluids for the circulation to be challenged so that I can really rely on the fact that the fluid challenge is a real negative or not. The same was for three milliliters per kilogram. It was only when we were giving four milliliters per kilogram that 95 percent of the patients were reliably increasing the mean systemic filling pressure, which means that I can really trust the test, whether it is positive and negative. And this was reflected in a completely different percentage of responders for patients, depending on the volume of fluid that was given. Now, uh, I'm going to conclude by showing you some extra information again uh, from Fenice. Um, as I show you, just by uh, giving slightly different doses of fluids, I can get very different information uh, from the fluid challenge that I'm given. But to me, the most important thing is that is whatever practice I use at the bedside, um, I need to use that information to inform myself about what I'm going to do next. Now, the interesting thing in Fenice was that in about 50% of the patients, Patient, yeah, clinicians gave an patient, clinicians gave an extra And then we went to see what was the correlation. We see what was the correlation between the so about 48 percent of patients with a positive response received an extra bolus of fluid. Uh, when we looked into this, we thought actually this is a good result. Um, not all patients that had an initial positive response received some extra fluids, and I think this is the right way of giving fluids. If I'm giving a bolus of fluid and the patient is now improved in terms of perfusion, the lactate is coming down, the blood pressure is better. I don't need to necessarily achieve the protopart on the French styling curve. There's not a physiological point to be. Um, however, probably that was not really the rationale for these results, because when we asked to same question to uh, patients in which it was a, a, an, a, an uncertain response to start with, again, 50% of these patients received an extra bolus of fluid. And what is worrying is that about 50% of patients in which the clinician decided there was an initial negative response to fluid receive some extra fluids. I think this can be dangerous. We're learning more and more that fluids are a drug and should be treated as such. And therefore, if we are sure that the patient has not responded to the bolus of fluid, probably we should stop and think about a different therapeutic strategy. And of course, it's very complex to treat this patient, but I think it's very important that we try to get all the information, yes, to avoid hypovolemia, but at the same time, we should be worried at the same time when we cause a fluid overload for our patient. Just giving fluids, just to try to see what happens, it's something that can be very deleterious, and we really we can just accumulate positive fluid balance unnecessarily. So I will not spend more time to decide how you can uh, look at different devices. Uh, we try to do this algorithm in a simple way, uh, just to give some advice on so now we can move Vermi from a, a less invasive device to a more invasive device uh, and vice versa, uh, but you can find some of the information here. Um, I've concluded my presentation and actually I have uh, questions that I would like to ask to all of you now. So um, if we take, for instance, this case, a 45 years old post-emergency laparotomy, uh, we are just now admitting this patient to the ICU. The patient is sedated and ventilated, the still tachycardic, the blood pressure is 90 over 50, the SCU2, because we've got a central line, is 62%, the lactate is 4.5, the hemoglobin is 10, and the cardiac index, we put a cardiac output monitor on, is 2.7 liter per minute. The pulse pressure variation is 20%. Uh, shall we give fluids? So let's vote for this. And Jean-Louis, maybe if you want, you can even comment on this. Uh, a comment? <laughs> what do you mean? Do you want me to, to give the answer? No. <laughs> you you want, if you can, you want, but we're going to show the answers very soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to have surprises like in the recent elections. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see what people voted. So we have about 86% of yes, 5% uh, no, and 10% I don't know. 
Uh, do you have any doubts, uh, Jean-Louis, in this situation about whether you would give some fluids or not? I have any doubt because blood pressure is low, uh, lactate is high, so we are in a situation of shock, really, and the patient is sedated, ventilated, and with a high PPV, I would give uh, fluids, yes. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. So, uh, why don't we move now to the day after? You know, we finish and now we are 12 hours later. The patient is still sedated and ventilated. The heart rate has come down to 100. But the blood pressure is still a bit soggy, 100 over 52. The SCV2 is 70%. Uh, the lactate is 1.1 and the HB is 9.5. And I didn't put it there, but we also know a little bit of noradrenaline. Um, so the pulse pressure variation is 16%. So we're only 12 hours within the admission. So shall we give some extra fluids? So let's vote for this one. Okay, 70% of the people have voted, a bit more. Okay, so 26% said they would give some extra fluids. 64% said they would not give fluids, and 10% said I don't know. What would you have done, Jean-Louis? Uh, I agree with the majority. I think that your message has been well taken. <laughs> uh, I think that either, even if PPV is high, we have no need to give fluid to this patient because uh, blood pressure is now okay, SCV2 is okay, lactate is uh, in a normal range. So this patient is fluid responsive, but he does not need fluid. Yeah, that, that, that is also the way I uh, treated this patient and normally I would approach this patient. So a, a bit of vasoplegia after a big operation or even after sepsis, it's something that I think you need to accept sometimes in these cases. Um, so even if you have a bit of noradrenaline, but the lactate is now normalized and we are, even if you are fluid responsive, I agree. Now we, 12 hours later in the care of this patient, we start to be in that phase where if we just pursue fluid unresponsiveness by just giving fluids every time the patient is responsive to fluids, I think we start to pay the price and we just get fluid overload, not necessarily improving the perfusion of, of this patient. Okay, so um, I'm just going to conclude, and this is my last slide. Um, I would just say, really, let's think about fluids as a drug. You know, any drug that we're giving, we always think whether we should give it in the right amount or not, and uh, importantly, whether we should give it first of all. Um, when we looked at uh, hemodynamic variables, we can only use dynamic variables, really, in a reliable way. Static variables have failed uh, continuously. Uh, to prove that it can be a valuable guide for our fluid management. Uh, let's use physiological goals, but let's keep some safety endpoints. Uh, and again, that's again important because maybe uh, trying to minimize post pressure variation, it's okay on the first hour of an admission to intensive care, but 24 hours later, it can be completely different. And the ultimate goal really is perfusion. It's not any uh, value in cardiac output, it's not any a value in pulse pressure variation, a cardiac output monitor is only useful if it's giving us a guide to give more or less compared to what we would have done without to improve the perfusion. And I really believe when we decide to give fluids, let's use the minimum dose that can inform us at best and give us the maximum benefit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maurizio, for this very nice presentation, very clear presentation, and your two good uh, examples of when to give and when not to give fluids, in spite of the presence of preload responsiveness. So, uh, we have I some questions. That maybe we had some technical issues at the beginning, which I apologize. Yeah. We can maybe yeah. carry on a bit longer with the discussion. So, please, yeah. if you have any questions. I, we have questions. So, some participants uh, uh, sent to me some questions to ask uh, to you. Uh, Many questions for monitoring, but I will. Uh, I want to 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 start by um, the beginning of your presentation. Uh, you insisted on uh, the U shape. I like this uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. representation of U shape of uh, Freedom Administration. Mm -hmm. So uh, less is not good, but uh, too much uh, is not good uh, too. And so one uh, participant asked uh, the question of uh, the nature of the fluid administration to avoid uh, uh, administration of uh, a huge amount of fluids. Uh, do you recommend crystalloids? I speak about uh, the mm -hmm. the nature for. Uh, so the question carbon. is: Would you give yeah. crystalloids or colloids, basically? Oh, or maybe albumin. So, so yeah. one one participant asked for administration to 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 avoid to give too much. So the, the <laughs> there is always this question is always a challenging question because as you know the practice is very yeah. variable worldwide. So I'll try to be honest and tell you what I do in my practice. Yeah. And in my practice I don't use synthetic colloids anymore. Uh, I use only crystalloids. Uh, you can argue whether saline is uh, much worse than uh, balanced solutions. I prefer balanced solutions, but I have to admit uh, the evidence is not as strong as one would think. Um, but I still use uh, sometimes albumin. Um, there have been meta-analyses not showing a, a great benefit actually for albumin if one wants to be uh, consistent with the literature. Uh, but I do believe that if you look at the recent studies, like the Albio study from uh, the group of Luciano Gattinoni, for instance, uh, to me there was a signal there that patients in septic shock uh, at the very beginning when they receive large volumes of crystalloids, uh, unvariable, their albumin level is a bit low, and there is some evidence, I think, that in that situation you can uh, minimize the amount of volume that you give. For, so to me, that's the indication that I still keep in my practice uh, to give albumin uh, when I give large volume of crystalloids in septic shock patients. But otherwise, my practice is to give uh, crystalloids. Uh, but one thing that I didn't mention uh, before, I very rarely, actually, I don't, anymore use maintenance fluids for my patient. I just give boluses of fluids if needed. Okay, so we have many questions about the uh, hemodynamic monitoring part of your talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, one question uh, is about uh, pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation. Uh, which is the best? Uh, PPV or SVV? What is your opinion about this? The, the truth is that if you look at control studies, that they, they are very, very similar. So in the situation where you can use either one uh, or the other, they are both uh, uh, behaving in a very similar way in the, in the, when they've been studied. So it's difficult to find one that is much better than the other. The only thing that I would say is that pulse pressure variation, it's a pure number, and so therefore it's easier also to um, to extrapolate the evidence when pulse pressure variation is being measured by many different devices. Uh, while when you look at stroke volume variation, probably you want to look at if the device that you have in front of your eyes that you have deciding whether you're going to use or not in your practice has been validated in that setting. Okay. Uh, I have questions about uh, the variation of um, the inferior vena cava. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this? And can we use the axillary vein? Uh, the axillary vein, I suspect this is a question maybe from someone that they must have read a new paper that I've not read. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe Jean-Louis, you can help me no, with that. No, the the truth is, if you look at, again, the what, what we are um, what we are applying is the same physiology, just looking at different windows. So the same physiology that causes cyclical changes on the arterial pressure waveform will also create some changes in the venous return. So looking at the venous side of the circulation is as valuable as looking at the arterial side of the circulation. However, sometimes there is confusion about the fact that if we look at the vena cava the limitations of the ventilation do not apply there. Well, actually, the same limitations that apply to pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation, they apply also for the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava. Um, recently, even the uh, jugular uh, pulse uh, variation uh, was demonstrated to be an accurate uh, marker of fluid responsiveness. So I suspect if somebody looked at the axillary vein or the axillary artery, they will find similar results. But to my knowledge, I've not seen a paper on that. Okay. okay. 
Okay. Uh, I have questions about um, the use of PPV and SVV together. Uh, <laughs> what you call it? Yes. Uh, it's not a question from from fro from me. Uh, it's a question from a <laughs> participant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> about the dynamic elastic elast um, dynamic elastance and what uh, what is the meaning and how to uh, to use in clinical practice. So, as you know, in, in, with my group, we have uh, started to study this now for uh, for a number of years. And uh, just for the people that are not familiar with this, the concept which was developed by uh, Michael Pinsky was uh, the idea that if we think about uh, pulse pressure and stroke volume, uh, there are patients that with an increase in stroke volume will increase the pulse pressure. And there are patients with an increase in stroke volume will not increase the pulse pressure. And the idea is that we can use actually the pulse pressure variation and the stroke volume variation as a window to this physiological concept. Now, the way, uh, the more and more I study this, uh, to me is uh, not just a marker of arterial load, the dynamic arterial elastance, it's probably a marker of arteroventricular coupling, which means that it depends both on the uh, vasoplegic or arterial load state of our patient, but at the same time on the contractility uh, state of our patient. One of the things that for my group is uh, very interesting to study in this sense is the fact that uh, maybe by looking at this, we could find a way to better titrate vasopressors or potentially to wean patients from uh, vasopressor therapy. Um, we know that normally the coupling between the ventricle and the artery means that the dynamic arterial elastane lies around one uh, states of uh, vasoplegia states that, uh, uh, for instance, can vasoconstrict the patient will change this ratio. So I think the potential in the future could be that maybe we could look at restoring a normal uh, dynamic arterial elastance to titrate the vasoactive drugs that we're giving. However, uh, I have to say the majority, uh, well, the, most of the studies that we've done, they were in a very controlled experimental settings. Uh, there is a French group by Guinot that has demonstrated that this could be useful uh, to potentially predict patients that can uh, resist to winning off uh, noradrenaline quickly. So it could potentially be used for that. But in my practice, I'm not using it clinically yet. It's still a field of research for me. Okay, thank you. Another question about uh, assessment of field responsiveness in patients with spontaneous breathing activity. Uh, with no intubation, for example, what is your practice? Well, I, I, this is a question for you, Jean-Louis, so probably you can comment <laughs> because the... You are the speaker. You are the, speaker. Um, so the, the only real test that we can do in that case is probably a passive leg raising test. I, I admit, when a patient is non-intubated and maybe comes out of theater, in my practice we've tried, and sometimes it's not that easy to have the patient compliant to changes in the bed positioning. So uh, I'm afraid sometimes what I find in my practice, if I cannot do reliably a passive leg raising test, I really try to assess very thoroughly whether there is a problem with perfusion. And if there is a problem with perfusion, sometimes I just decide to give a fluid challenge. But that's why my group have done so much research on the field of fluid challenge, because we think that sometimes maybe you are uh, forced in the situation to give a fluid challenge. And rather than giving a liter, let's just give what is needed and in my practice, I give now uh, four milliliters per kilogram in a very short period of time, so about five to 10 minutes, and I assess the response with a cardiac output monitor. I have questions about this free this challenge. Uh, some uh, de delegates, some participants ask uh, if the patient uh, uh, respond, to, respond to the free challenge, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, with some dissipation, very quick dissipation yes. of the effects, uh, what to do? You know, this is a, a very, very good clinical question, and, and it's actually it's a question that I ask myself as well. <laughs> and, uh, um, because those patients, if they do it systematically, are very challenging patients to treat. Um, what I tend to do normally, if I take a patient with shock, in the immediate phase, uh, you always have a therapeutic dilemma. Uh, do you want to increase the cardiac output? And are you happy to pay the price for a slight uh, increase in fluid balance? My answer usually in the very first couple of hours is yes. So if the patient responds to fluids and dissipates the effect, but I'm still in those initial hours 
of, uh, of stabilization, I will still probably give another fluid challenge and see if this becomes a systemic response of the patient or not. Uh, but to answer this question, those patients in which it becomes apparent that if you carry on doing this, you will just be giving five, six liters of fluids, then it's sometimes you have to accept uh, that maybe you have to uh, accept a, a vasopressor load, which is a bit higher than what you normally would be happy, uh, leave the thing, and, and as I said, if I'm in a phase of a septic shock patient, I will also try to give some albumin in this case. Okay. Uh, I have a question which is uh, about, um, you spoke about free responsiveness uh, indices using monitors, and uh, the question is, uh, do we have uh, any evidence of uh, improvement of outcome of patients using dynamic uh, uh, variables of free responsiveness? So if you're asking me, do we have any evidence of uh, using any of these cardiac output monitors whether the mortality decreases in this patient? Uh, the answer is actually no. Uh, however, uh, I think to do a study in these settings is incredibly complex, Jean-Louis because uh, to standardize uh, uh, you know, all the dynamic situations of this patient to, into, a single, uh, into a single inclusion criteria, which is what you should do uh, to do a study like this, is incredibly difficult. So for me, uh, the physiological evidence, it's enough to justify that when I'm in a complex patient, I want to get some extra information. And as I said to you before, it's not about giving these extra fluids, it's to feel a bit more sure that maybe I can restrict the amount of fluids that I'm giving to this patient if I don't see a response, and therefore to change my tack. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the clinical uh, case. Um, uh, someone okay, asked. Yes. Well, someone asked uh, in the second case, mm -hmm. second example, uh, why not to give fluids? and trying to reduce the dose of vasopressors. Yeah, probably what I failed to do here, I didn't put the dose of uh, noradrenaline, because I agree um, that in, sometimes, and when you are in this situation, I would say I would not give fluids, but it is true that if I give you more information, maybe you can think about it. Because if we are in this situation with a CVO2 of 70%, the lactate is 1.1, the noradrenaline is running at maybe 0 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. Frankly, I would not give fluids. But if I am still in a very profound vasoplegic state, and maybe the capillary field time is still extended, and there's a mottling of the skin, and the noradrenaline is 1 mics per kilo per minute, of course, then uh, that could maybe change partially my, my thinking. Um, I just wanted to keep the case simple and actually realistic. It's usually not common to see a big improvement in perfusion and still see a profound vasoplegic state with incredibly high dose of uh, noradrenaline. Okay. Uh, Maurizio, do we, do we have time to, to continue the discussion? Because I have many uh, questions. I think I see, I see that there is still a lot of people are connected and considering that we had a technical problem, I think we all do okay, this for okay. some time to answer more questions. So I'm happy with that. Okay. So I, I have to go back to uh, to full responsiveness again, uh, some uh, some participants ask about uh, um, the time we need to wait for the effects of passive leg raising. Um, okay, uh, as you know, the effect is basically immediate, and indeed, waiting too long uh, can actually be a problem in these cases. So. Uh, what we found in our pharmacodynamic study on the fluid challenge, and I was not on a passive leg raising, but the passive leg raising, as you know, it's similar to an autologous fluid challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, the effect that you see on the mobilization of intravascular volume is very fast. Uh, indeed, uh, just to give you an example, if I suspect if you had to do your study, Jean-Louis, with a pulmonary artery catheter, I'm not sure you would have found those areas under the curve. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, an, acquisition, an acquisition that is fast is incredibly important, and you should be there at the bedside and uh, monitoring the change when you do it. This is why we need a real-time uh, monitoring uh, device, uh, to, yeah. to, not, to, not to miss the maximal effects, which in general yeah. uh, occur uh, after 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Indeed. Okay, 
I have also questions about uh, atrial fibrillation and fluid responsiveness. Uh, how to how to do in this situation of atrial fibrillation? Yeah, in the, in this situation, you are left only with uh, continuous measurements of uh, cardiac output that can be averaged uh, over a period of seconds. So. Uh, the irregular uh, heartbeat that you have can actually be compensated by taking a series of stroke volume by these cardiac output monitors, and therefore you can still get a, um, a stroke, an average stroke volume that then you can follow. Clearly, you cannot use pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation in these cases. However, uh, either doing a fluid challenge or a passive leg raising test, as you've demonstrated, can also be done in cases in which you have atrial fibrillation, as long, of course, that the atrial fibrillation is controlled in terms of heart rate. If you have fast atrial fibrillation running 160, well, it's not time to be very uh, clever about the fluids. You need to control the fast atrial fibrillation, and then we can think about fine-tuning uh, the fluids that we're giving. Okay. Another question about platysmographic variability. Uh, do you use, and uh, in which kind of patients? Yeah, the, uh, it is uh, definitely uh, a possibility. Uh, my cutoff for these uh, completely non-invasive devices that rely somehow on the peripheral perfusion is not to use them in cases of uh, uh, profound vasoplegia. So if a patient is running uh, noradrenaline normally, I would not uh, use uh, uh, this. Uh, but as you know, I also uh, work in the perioperative settings. And in that case, in the context of uh, surgical patients, uh, then it's uh, absolutely fine to use uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, very uh, low level of invasive devices because you don't have a shock state. You just have a patient that is at risk of hypovolemia. You can uh, optimize the, the fluid status. A question, yes. A question about diuresis, uh, urine output. Uh, can we use it uh, for, for fluid administration to guide fluid administration or not? What do you think about uh, this? I, I really would say no, Jean-Louis, and I think it's actually one of the pitfalls of uh, our practice is that very often we react to a drop to 20 milliliters per hour of urine output, and maybe we give 500 mLs of fluid, and then we are happy if there are 60 mLs per hour for one hour. If you think about the mathematics, it's just a nonsense, and, uh, and there is also data that giving a lot of fluid can actually increase the congestion of our kidneys, can increase the chloride load to our kidneys and make the kidneys worse. So to me, a low urine output is, of course, part of the clinical assessment to identify a patient that is potentially hypoperfused. But I cannot really use it to titrate my fluid management. I totally agree. A question about echocardiography. Uh, do you think that echo can... Uh replace uh, continuous hemodynamic monitoring in the future or not? What do you think about the place of echo? I think if you're talking about in the future, you know, we really don't know what the future is going to reserve for us. I, I do no. think that we all need to uh, use more echo. If you remember a, a few years ago, there was a, a, a transesophageal probe, which is still available, which is yeah. uh, less invasive, and you can live in a patient for 72 hours and can give you data, not to the level of a normal echo pro but still uh, in a continuous way so you know if you say in 15 years maybe we will have a, a, a probe on the uh, on the chest of the patient that will show us a 3d heart how it's working and inform us about everything in this moment uh, in my practice i don't have the budget to have uh, an echo continuously in every patient so for me echo is a point of care testing to see what's happening uh, but then i uh, when i've decided i want to uh, have a continuous uh, um, therapy, and I want to monitor the therapy, I will still use the two combined. Okay. Uh, I have a general question about uh, intestinal, intestinal ischemia. Um, so one participant says that sometimes we give a lot of vasopressors, a lot of fluids, and, is, and thus there is some uh, intestinal ischemia, but we need some markers of uh, intestinal ischemia. Uh, sometimes lactate is not so high, so how do you deal with this uh, problem of intestinal ischemia and detection of intestinal ischemia? Well, first of all, if you, uh, you probably need to classify also why you have intestinal ischemia, because if I have intestinal ischemia because I'm in a low perfusion state, 
uh, my management does not change compared you know to to the rest of things so I highlight it it's always in my mind I think maybe the gut is not working so I always look at SCV2 and PCO2 gaps and I see if the perfusion is improving if the lactate then still goes up and does not improve I think asking the question of gut ischemic in that case is a very uh, sensible one the question is in terms of how do you then treat when you've identified um, I don't I don't identify yes yes I don't yeah. identify so identify, uh, uh, you know, I'm old fashioned in these things. I still think that, uh, you know, uh, trying to have a clinical examination and also speak with our surgeons early is very important. Now, why are you developing ischemic, uh, you know, um, an ischemic gut? Is it because your intradominal pressure is rising, for instance, in the context of trauma or in the context of a big fluid shift like you can have after an abdominal aneurysm uh, repair? Uh, so measuring that can be, uh, very important. Uh, however, I would argue that lactate often rises fast enough when you have an ischemic gut. The problem is discriminating between a systemic hyperlactatemia, so a systemic hypoperfusion, or a localized hypoperfusion in the context of an ischemic gut. And that, of course, it's uh, something that sometimes we also have to convince our surgeons to come and have a look and sometimes just go and take the patient to theater, which I've done in several occasions. Okay, I agree. So, uh, be, before uh, finishing this uh, session, I have a question uh, from uh, some participants about the place, the current place of the pulmonary artery catheter. You, you, you can imagine this kind of questions, of course, because uh, now we have uh, uh, many, many uh, hemodynamic devices, echocardiography. So, what is the place of PA catheter? You know, it's fascinating because if you look at the sales of the pulmonary artery catheter, despite the fact that there have been more devices coming out on the market, they've been pretty stable for the last 20 years. So um, while it is true that we have uh, different devices, people still use the pulmonary artery catheter. Um, in my uh, department, we still use a lot of pulmonary artery catheter after cardiac surgery. And we have a lot of threshold uh, to put them, especially in patients that maybe develop pulmonary hypertension. In my unit, uh, where I work uh, mainly in a general intensive care unit, I have to say I'm using it less and less, not because I don't like it, just because I am having uh, my trainees, sometimes they stay with me for three months or six months, and it's very difficult now to maintain the skills in the team for people to be familiar with the information. I still love it, and I still think it can be a very valuable device, again, especially in the case of pulmonary uh, hypertension but uh, the um, but the bottom line I think if you want to look at the right ventricle now probably echocardiography very often give you a uh, very valuable information and you can repeat the test too but I would say uh, patients with uh, uh, right uh, um, right ventricular failure and pulmonary hypertension they can still benefit from monitor with the pulmonary artery cutter that provided that you have a team that is skilled to, to look into that. You know, sometimes we do the mistake of uh, doing something because we are there at the bedside, but we forget that our patients are there 24 seven. And then you, if in the night there isn't someone that can interpret the data, it becomes a bit more complicated. Okay, so we have so many questions. You cannot imagine, right? So we cannot answer all the questions because of, uh, of, of time. But I have, there are many questions, but also many congratulations for your, your very, very nice presentation. And I think that maybe it is time to, to, to finish this uh, okay. webinar. The only thing, Jean-Louis, sorry to interrupt, it just is a communication. We want to apologize for the initial technical problems yeah. that we had with uh, uh, the GoToWebinar, but I hope that the, when we restarted, I saw the people came back, so I'm very grateful to everyone for sticking with us. And also, we can guarantee the webinar will be made available tomorrow on the website of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Okay, so I want to, to thank you. I want to, to thank the SICM, of course, and Shita Medical for sponsoring this webinar. And I see many, many, many uh, congratulations for, for your fantastic presentation. Again, many hundreds of... Uh, messages saying uh, that it is very it was very interesting so congratulations Mauricio for this brilliant talk and uh, I would like to thank all the participants for their 
questions and reactions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jean-Louis, and thank, thank you, you Chico. Everybody.